are back. Welcome back to the Profitable Dentist event here in Orlando, Florida. If you're not here with us in person at the Hyatt Regency Orlando, then you're missing out. You should come to this event live in person. Watching live on Facebook is obviously great. I mean, you can't really drop a heart emoji in real life, I don't think. You can only do it on Facebook, right? But it's great to be here in person to network with other people. We're just talking about uh, meeting doctors even from other countries who are here and being able to connect and have great conversations and share good ideas. So speaking of good ideas, the next person who you're gonna hear from today, his ideas have been heard by, shared by, and listened to around the world. I don't know how many countries, probably all of the countries in the world, have heard of this guy. He is the pod father of dentistry. He is the very first podcast in dentistry. And if you've paid attention to continuing education, if you've paid attention to modern day learning and dentistry podcasts are probably part of the way you now learn. The pod father of dentistry is the first one with a podcast and he has a passion for helping dentists. His podcast name is the Thriving Dentist Audio Podcast. It's the number one dental <laughs> podcast on iTunes. It's a weekly radio show and this gentleman interviews some of the most influential leaders in the dental profession where they discuss all the tips and they help doctors develop practices that are both personal and professional satisfaction enabling. This person is a good friend of mine. We've uh, been able to be at events in mutual, uh, sharing mutual stages before. He's a guy of very high integrity. He's a guy who actually cares. He is not a dentist, yet he owns a practice, and he's made an incredible mark on the business side of dentistry from coast to coast and around the world. It is my great honor to introduce to you Mr. Gary Takis. Well, thank you, Jamie and Bill and Elijah. You know, it is great to be here with you all, and it's great to be here with our wonderful hosts. Um, a little bit of trivia before I dive in. Bill, I was thinking about this this morning. You know how long you and I have known each other? 35 years. 35 years. Dr. Bill Williams and I have been wonderful friends. Uh, hard to believe it's been 35 years, hasn't it? It's been, it's been a fun ride, but it's fun to have you hosting this event today. Everywhere I show up, there Gary is. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure to be here. Did everyone pick up their caffeine suppository from Gary Cady's booth? Does he have some energy or what? <laughs> I mean, wasn't that fun? And I love his acronyms. I love his acronyms. I think we should have a quiz at the end of the event for, um, does everyone remember what a ninja is? A ninja? Yeah, no, I'm not just an assistant. And I absolutely love that uh, name for hygienist. A high genius. Do we have any high genius in the room? Isn't that amazing? Uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I was following the Facebook feed as we were, uh, as I was watching Gary and a really good friend of mine, I'm going to go ahead and give him a shout out, uh, Dr. Rob Ritter uh, from uh, South Florida. He said, I'm sitting here on the beach watching the live Facebook feed with my phone, and on my tablet, I have my dental and tell dashboard up where I'm monitoring my practice performance, and he's sitting on the beach. Now, how cool is that? <laughs> All right. Well, hey, uh, this uh, segment is called Dentistry Rocks, Mastering the Art of a Thriving Practice. Uh, I'm sure my slide advancer is working. Uh, do we have the, uh-oh. Oh, there we go. A uh, little bit of background on myself. Uh, I'm not a dentist. I never have been. My background's the business side of dentistry. Uh, I started in 1980, so my goodness, 38 years ago. Uh, I've had the privilege of, of actually coaching in uh, over 2,200 practices over the years. Uh, it's been an amazing ride, amazing career, and uh, absolutely love it. But, I, but I'm not a dentist. I never have been a dentist. I'll flash through these background slides really quick. I speak at major dental meetings uh, pretty much every Friday, somewhere around the country. I've actually given about uh, 15,000 hours of, of CE. Uh, written quite a few dental, dental journals, uh, articles in dental journals. And also, uh, as Jamie mentioned, I'm the creator of the Thriving Dentist Show podcast. 
I happen to enjoy listening to podcasts, and I like to listen to business stuff is the kind of stuff I listen to. But in late 2011, I looked around to see if there was anything in dentistry, and there wasn't. So I said, well, you know what? I'm going to learn how to podcast, and I'm going to create my own. So in late 2011, I created The Thriving Dentist Show, and my vision was to interview authorities in dentistry, and every Wednesday, publish a new show. So uh, two days ago was Wednesday. That was our uh, 328th show. Uh, in fact, I've interviewed all three of you on The Thriving Dentist Show, so it was kind of fun. Uh, it's free. Uh, it's on iTunes. It's on Google Play if you're an Android person. We have listeners in 162 countries. So uh, if you, we'd love to welcome you as a listener if you've never had a chance to listen in. Now, maybe the most important part of my background is, uh, as, as Jamie mentioned, I'm not a dentist. I never have been, but I do own a dental practice. And I wanted to own a dental practice because I wanted to have a test kitchen where we could test these concepts out and then I could apply them when I'm teaching and apply them with my clients. So I bought a dilapidated backwards fixer upper practice in May of 07. It had ankle high orange shag carpet and avocado green countertops. Anyone kind of get a, a vision of this? Um, however, what it did have, what it lacked in decor, uh, it did have about a thousand active patients, all of whom needed treatment. Uh, and so I bought that practice with Dr. Paul Nielsen. Paul is a 2005 graduate of the University of Washington. Uh, bought that practice in May of 07, and for the last 11 years, we've been evolving it to be our ideal practice. Uh, today, we have two dentists, Dr. Paul Nielsen, Dr. Tim Schmidt. Um, I'm a big believer, for the high geniuses in the room, I'm a big believer of a hygiene-driven practice. Yes, I'm seeing some heads not up and down out there on Facebook Live. Do you believe in a hygiene-driven practice? Yeah, the reason I love a hygiene-driven practice is, number one, it keeps our patients healthier. Right? If we're seeing them on a regular basis, we keep them healthier. But the second reason I like it is it gives us more exam opportunities, gives us more opportunity to prevent problems before they become future problems. Plus, it feeds the doctor's schedule. So today, we have 15 days of hygiene a week. So I have three hygienists that work four days a week, one hygienist that work three days a week. So you add that together, we have 15 uh, days of hygiene. We're open Monday through Thursday, 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., open on Friday from 7 to 2. Uh, we're a general practice, but we also do uh, some more advanced services, things like dental implants. Uh, we do some adult ortho. We do Invisalign six-month smiles. Uh, we do some cosmetic dentistry. You know, cosmetic dentistry could be anything, but I tend to think of it as veneers. Uh, we do quite a few veneers. Uh, we do some full mouth re rehabilitation dentistry. And then we're now treating uh, sleep apnea with appliance therapy. Uh, so our practice is probably a lot like yours. See if I can get our slide advancer to work. Uh, while we're getting the AV all squared away, if you're going to be successful today in dentistry, um, I want you to think of it kind of like a three-legged milk stool. Um, and the three legs that we have to have if we're going to succeed today in, in 2018 and beyond, number one, we've got to deliver clinical excellence. Would you guys agree with me on that? If we don't do great dentistry, we can't have a great practice. So we've got to do great dentistry. The second thing that we need to do is we need to master the business side of dentistry, have some business acumen. We've got to make a profit. What does it mean to master the business side of dentistry? To be able to make a profit doing good dentistry. And the third thing that we need to do is we need to master the people side of dentistry. The people side of dentistry. The human side. And I really want to get your arms around this because it's the human side that that's the way the patients experience you in your practice. Think about that for just a minute. The lens through which patients experience you and your care is through the human side. Patients don't know about the clinical quality of excellence that you deliver unless you tell them. Um, however, they do know how they're treated and they know how they interact with team members. They know if you remember their name when they come in. So that third side, the people side of dentistry is extremely important. Thank you, thank you, much appreciated. All right, we've got an awesome AV team here today, and they're helping us keep everything running smoothly and efficiently. So much appreciated. Okay, so I was showing this slide of the three-legged milk stool. Here we go. And maybe, come on, come on. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Um, so the analogy that I like to say you know, is imagine two of your patients, imagine that they're in your practice, and they are at the grocery store together. 
Can you imagine that happening in your practice? You've got two patients who are at the grocery store together. They don't know each other. And one of them is pushing their cart one way down the aisle. The other's pushing the cart the other way down the aisle. And they bump into each other. Can you imagine that happening? They bump into each other and they strike up a conversation. And the one thing they discover that they have in common is they both go to the same dentist. They both go to the same dentist. They say, oh my gosh, I go to that dentist as well. Can you imagine those two people having a conversation like this? Oh my gosh, I did not have incisal edge translucency on number eight and nine before I started going to this dentist, and now I do. They would never say anything like that. Or the other patient says, oh, I didn't have canine guidance, and now I have canine guidance. They'd never say something like that. But if they were going to say something about the practice, what, what might they say? What might they say? They might say, I love going there because every time I go there, the front desk team member knows my name. Or I love the hygienist because every time the hygienist, thank you, Jamie, every time the hygienist sees me, she gives me a bear hug. I love her. I love her. Okay, I think we've got a better advancer here. Let's see. All right, so success requires mastering three distinct realms. Number one, you've got to do clinical excellence, as I said. Number two, you have to master the business side of dentistry. You have to have business acumen. You've got to make a profit. If otherwise, you can't serve your patients. And number three, you've got to have master the behavioral sciences, the people side of dentistry. And I want to amplify this analogy too. If any of those three legs if they're not the same length, then the stool's gonna be unstable. Does that make sense? So you wanna have an equal balance to these three different realms. So I'll show you a quick picture here of my practice, Life Smiles. This is part of our team. Uh, last year, we were together at the Pacific Northwest Dental Conference. Uh, Dr. Paul Nielsen, Dr. Tim Schmidt, and some of my team members. It's called Life Smiles Dental Care. Life Smiles is kind of a made up name. We just thought it sounded kind of fun. Anyway, that's us. So now you have a little bit better sense of who we are. Uh, I want to introduce, introduce you to one of my mentors, Stephen Covey. Stephen Covey is an author. He wrote a brilliant book in 1989 called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And uh, what Stephen Covey did was over a 20-year period of time, he studied people that were considered extremely successful in whatever area of expertise they had. And he was trying to learn what common denominators they had in their personality. And he identified there were seven common denominators that these successful people had. And out of that came the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Habit number two is begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. I want to take a minute and amplify that for just a minute. And I'm going to begin my presentation with the end in mind by sharing with you six specific goals of a thriving practice. Here are six specific goals for a thriving practice. So this, this is the idea of beginning with the end in mind. I'm going to number these one through six. They're not numbered in importance. They're numbered so I can remember to cover each one of them. Number one, overhead no higher than 60%, ideally 50%. Number two, enough, you, 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 you heard a number of people talk about this already. Gary talked about it. Um, and Craig talked about it. Peter talked about it. You deserve to create financial independence, doctors, for yourself as well as your, as well as your team members. So goal number two is the ability to create financial independence from your practice, from your practice. Number three, enough income in your practice so that you can have a state-of-the-art office, you can have modern equipment, you can have a generous CE budget, you can use the best labs if you use an outside lab, you have the latest technology, and you still control your overhead at 60% or less. It just got a lot harder, didn't it? You bet. No one said these were easy, but they are possible. Number four, a high-performance team you truly love and enjoy working with. High performance team you truly love and enjoy working with. Number five, patients you enjoy taking care of. You don't have to love your patients, but I want you to enjoy taking care of them. If you have patients in your practice that cause you to lose heart muscle and stomach lining, I think they need to be under the care of another dentist. And finally, number six, treatment mix that gives you satisfaction. That has to be self-defined because every dentist likes different things. Some dentists love the idea of endo. Another dentist finds it tedious. One dentist loves a four-hour cosmetic appointment. Another dentist would prefer to do a different type of procedure. So you have to self-define that. Of those six goals, they're all important, but which one of those, if you're watching this on Facebook Live, I'll ask you to think about this, 
Which one of those do you think is most important? I'll ask the audience that. Which one do you think is most important of those six? Enthusiasm around dentistry. But this is an incredible time to be in our profession. As I'm looking out in the audience here, I see young dentists, I see mid-career dentists, I see senior dentists. Regardless of where you are in your career, this is an amazing time to be in dentistry. Do you guys believe that? Yeah. I, how about on Facebook? Do you guys believe that? And the simple reason I believe that is we have the ability to change people's lives every day. Yes? We have the ability to change people's lives every day. It could be dentally. A patient could come to us with some really compromised dentition. I believe the way the kids call that these days, they have a jacked up grill, right? <laughs> and we can provide this beautiful dentistry that allows that patient to blossom. You, you've seen patients like that in your practice, right? So they're very um, shy, reserved, they lack self-confidence, uh, they hold their hand up around their mouth when they smile, uh, and then we provide this gorgeous smile, what happens to them? They blossom. You literally see them um, have renewed self-confidence, a, a much better feeling about themselves, and it changes their personality. It doesn't have to be anything as complex as that, though. It could be a patient that just needed someone to listen to them. Yes? Uh, just by a show of hands, did that happen to anyone this week? where you had a patient in your office that really just needed someone to listen to them. Yeah, I'm seeing lots of hands go up. And isn't that wonderful? And let's take a hat off to yourself, uh, to our dental team members, uh, our doctors in the audience. Uh, awesome that you were those ears that provided the listening that that patient needed. So pardon my enthusiasm, but dentistry absolutely rocks. And by the way, it's not easy. I want to take my hat off to you all. Dentistry's tough. It's a, it's a challenge. Um, and you guys do such an amazing job of taking care of your patients and helping your practice be as profitable as possible. And I want to take a minute and recognize you all. So I'm going to incorporate a musical reference into this course. Let's backtrack to 1968, a band burst on the scene by the name of Led Zeppelin. Um, yes, I'm going to incorporate Led Zeppelin into this course today. So just in case you're on who wants to be a millionaire, and the question is, who are the four original band members of Led Zeppelin? I want to make sure you get that right. So let's go ahead and cover that for you. John Paul Jones was the keyboard bassist, quite talented. Uh, Robert Plant was on vocals. Robert Plant's the guy with his arms up there in the, on the slide. He was the face and the voice of, of Led Zeppelin. Then we had Jimmy Page on guitar. I happen to be a student of rock guitar. And I'm going to make a subjective statement, I realize it's subjective, but I think he's one of the greatest, if not the greatest, rock guitarist of all time. I see a number of he hands and uh, heads nod on that one. And finally, if you're going to play rock music, you have to have a drummer. And John Bonham was the drummer uh, for Led Zeppelin. Sadly, John Bonham passed away in 1980. That's an important detail in this story, just remember that detail. Fast forward now to December 2nd, 2012. It's at the Kennedy Awards Center. There's the three remaining band members of Led Zeppelin. And at the Kennedy Awards Center, they decided to, uh, the Kennedy Awards Center uh, decided to play a tribute to the band and play their epic song, Stairway to Heaven. Uh, now, at the Kennedy Awards Center every year in December, they bestow a Lifetime Achievement Award to three performing artists. And in 2012, the three performing artists that earned that distinction were the three band members of Led Zeppelin, Dustin Hoffman, and David Letterman. I think you'd agree that's a pretty good group of performers, right? So they decided to put together a tribute band to pay, play this epic song, Stairway to Heaven. And I want to describe to you the composition of this band because it's rather interesting. So number one, Anne and Nancy Wilson from the band Heart. Anne Wilson on vocals, Nancy Wilson on acoustic guitar. Next, the entire Washington DC Philharmonic Orchestra playing string instruments as well as wind instruments. So now we've got classic musicians playing rock music. 
Now we've got two separate gospel choirs, an all-female gospel choir that came up on stage, and then a mixed-gender men and women gospel choir that came up on a riser behind the band. At one point in this performance, there's 104 musicians on stage. And finally, if you're going to play rock music, you have to have a drummer, right? Well, you remember I told you in the story that John Bonham passed away in 1980. His son, Jason Bonham, was seven years old at the time when his dad died. Jason Bonham went on to become a very accomplished rock drummer. And guess who they brought on to play drums as a performance? None other than Jason Bonham. Now, I would like to play this performance for you today, but I can't. Facebook doesn't allow it. So I'm simply going to ask you sometime this weekend at this course, go to YouTube and type in Led Zeppelin Tribute and watch that six, uh, six minute and 10 second performance. Six minute and 10 second, it's amazing. It may be the greatest musical performance of all time. <clears throat> but I'm gonna describe to you what happens so that I can make my point here in the course. Near the end of the song, which is, is incredible, Ann Wilson hits this note that it, it's hard to believe a person could sing and hit that note so perfectly. Robert Plant, the vocalist for Led Zeppelin, was leaning forward in the balcony, and you could see his eyes kind of glaze over as she hits this note. Can you picture that in your mind's eye? And as she carries this note, a tear rolls down his left cheek. A single tear rolls down his left cheek. And the emotion, every time I see that performance, I literally get goosebumps. And I want you to think about that for just a second. I want you to think about what happened. And so what is the lesson that we can take away from that performance? What is the lesson? And how does it apply to dentistry? How does that apply to dentistry? Well, I think it applies this way. And I think there's a number of things that we can take away from, from that performance. And the lesson that I got from it is number one, dentistry is a team sport. There were 104 musicians on stage creating that performance. Secondly, the sum of the parts are greater than the individual parts. The sum of the parts are greater than the individual. That's true for your office as well. We could have great individual team members, but it's how you come together that makes the difference. But I think the real reason why the tear rolled down Robert Plant's left cheek is I think he was looking around, he looked at his fellow band members, you know, their best friends, and I think he's thinking, my goodness, we're kind of in the fourth quarter of our life. We're not gonna have much more time here on earth. But you know what? Our music goes on forever. And I believe there's a word that crossed Robert Plant's mind as he watched that performance. And I believe the word is this, legacy. I think he was thinking about his legacy. Were you thinking the same thing? Yeah. And so I have some questions for you, doctors and team members. I've got three for you. Number one, are you creating a legacy? And I believe the answer to that question is either yes or no. Make sense? Are you creating a legacy? It's not, well, I do on Monday, but not on Tuesday. Have you ever seen our office on Tuesday? We're not doing a legacy on Tuesday. <laughs> the next question, if the honest answer to the first one is not quite, my next question is, what would need to change for you to begin to create a legacy? And I believe if everyone in this room would give yourself the luxury of answering that question, I believe every one of you could answer that question. What would need to change? And by the way, I don't think a legacy is something you do from age 59 to 60, or 58 to 59, or whatever age you want to put in there. I think a, le a legacy are the small things we do every day that contribute to the imprint that we make on this earth. Do you guys agree with me on that? I talked to Paul and Tim, they're young doctors. In my I've talked to Paul and Tim every day about legacy, because legacy is something we do every day. The next question I have for you, if you know what you would do now, what would you change? What would you change? If you know that answer now, the next question is, when would you make those changes? I happen to appreciate the world of ecology. I, I imagine some of you do as well. 
And there's a saying in the world of ecology that goes like this. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is today. And so there'd be no better time than today to start making those changes. The rest of this course is going to be all about tactics and how to make those changes, how to actually make the changes. So now we're going to get on to the tactical side of what we're talking about here. Hope you have the right mindset. And the mindset that I want you to have is legacy. How do you, doctors, how do you want to be remembered on the imprint that you left on this planet when it, came to, when it comes to taking care of patients? So let's get on to these tactics, and I'm going to talk about four very specific tactics that will help you develop a thriving practice. So here they are. Number one, reduce your insurance dependency. Number two, develop a, I'm going to talk about all these in detail, develop a comprehensive marketing plan. Number three, use digital photos for patient education. And number four, create a remarkable new patient experience. If you did those four things upon returning to your practice, you'll be well on your way towards establishing a legacy. Does that make sense? Let's start with that first one, reducing insurance dependency. I like to call it breaking free from the shackles of insurance. Anyone with me on this one? Do you like to break free from the shackles of insurance? If you're out there on Facebook, want to break free from the shackles of insurance, you bet. So let's talk about this for just a minute when it comes to insurance. Somehow the whole insurance world has gotten out of control. It was started by dentists for dentists. What happened? What happened? Newsflash, the current dental insurance system is broken. Yes? Think about it for just a minute. There are four entities when it comes to insurance. The dental insurance company, the dentist, the patient, and the employer who bought the policy. Those are the four groups that are somehow related to dental insurance. Again, the dental insurance company, the dentist, the, pa the patient who received the care, and the company that bought it. In those four groups, there's only one winner today. The only entity that benefits today is the insurance company. Patients lose. Heaven forbid that they would come in in five months and 29 days after the last hygiene appointment to have their teeth cleaned. What's going to happen? <coughs> Denied. So the patient loses. The dentist loses because the average discount on a PPO plan is 38%. The dentist loses. The company that bought the policy loses because they paid a 50 to 55% premium for that policy. The only entity that wins is who? The insurance company. It's time to change that. And I'll show you how to do that. I'm gonna put this slide up and just ask you to look at that. And if you're on Facebook Live, I hope you have a copy of the slides so you can look at that yourself. I'm gonna pause and just let you look at that slide for just a minute. What I have up on the screen is six different CEOs of insurance companies and their annual salaries. What can we learn about watching and looking at that slide? Joseph's a slacker. <laughs> He's a piker. For example, Dr. Williams, I know a bit about your practice. Um, they might choose your practice because you have a vast amount of experience. They might choose you because of the amazing reviews that you have online. They might choose you because your adoption of technology that you have in your practice. All true, correct? True. They might choose Dr. Williams because he and his team members deliver world-class customer service. Absolutely. And imagine what goes through a patient's mind if they're choosing you for those reasons other than I looked online and he's on my plan. See the difference? It's a massive difference. So let's talk about three components of a comprehensive marketing plan. So I believe every marketing plan should have some internal marketing all about creating raving fans. The, uh, Dr. Williams, would you agree with me that the very best new patient, they're all good, right? But aren't the best the kind that get referred by a patient that says you guys are fantastic? Those that know me instead of know my insurance company. That's right, those that know him instead of the insurance company. So I want to create more raving fans. Secondly, even though this is a digital world, as evidenced by our course today, right? 
I do believe we should do some external marketing because not everybody is digital. So we want to roll the red carpet out and see all kinds of new patients. But really, digital marketing is where all of the cool things are happening today. But before I get to digital marketing, I want to talk about something you can do with analog marketing that's very exciting. One of the things we do at my practice is we make NFL quality mouth guards for our local high school football team, our local high school football team. This is both a community service project and a marketing project. Does anybody in this room or on Facebook Live think that I want a practice full of 16 and 17 year old boys? No. But who do we want? Their parents, their grandfathers, their aunts, their uncles. That's who we want. And by the way, the reason I can say these are NFL quality mouth guards, the team dentist from, from the Oakland Raiders and Golden State Warriors taught us how to make these mouth guards. It's a dual layer mouth guard. We make these. It's a good time to be doing this. Here we are um, in the end of April. We make these mouth guards in June for our team. Our team has 64 boys. We, make, we have 32 kids come in on a Tuesday night. We take the impressions for the 32 kids. We stay open from 5 to 7. They can come in any time. Uh, the other 32 come in on Wednesday night. And over the next couple weeks, we actually make these mouth guards. We do not charge for them. Uh, we invite their parents. Uh, we, we require at least one parent to come with them because I need to have a consent form signed. But more importantly, I want to market it. I want the parents there for marketing reasons. Last year, we did... Um, 64 mouth guards. We track everything we do copiously in the practice. We did $101,000 worth of dentistry on the people that came in from the mouth guards. It cost us about $1,000 for the materials. We did $101,000 worth of dentistry. That's a very nice 100 to 1 ROI, return on investment. Um, if any of you are interested in this, on my podcast, The Thriving Dentist Show, there's an entire episode. You can search by topic. There's an entire episode. It's on thrivingdentist.com. You can search for that episode, and I go through all the details about how to make the mouth guards. Great, very good marketing project. Now let's switch gears and talk about uh, digital marketing, because that's really where it's at today. And that's where if someone moves to your town, they're looking for a, a dentist, the way they're going to find a dentist is by going online. What's the number one search engine in the world? Google. What's number two? Who cares? <laughs> but in case anybody asks, it's YouTube, which is owned by Google. We're right back to Google. So here's an eight component digital marketing plan. Number one, strong website that's optimized for search. How can you tell if your website works? If you type in dentist your town, Dentist Scottsdale, Dentist Atlanta, Dentist New York, and you come up on page one, your, practice, your website works. Number two, make sure it's mobile enhanced because last year, 68% of all searches for a dentist originated from a mobile device. Number three, use microsites in addition to your website. So have individual microsites for some of the bigger services that you do, for dental implants, for adult orthodontics, for cosmetic dentistry, for sedation dentistry, and so on. It enhances the performance of your site. Number three, search engine optimization. So when people are looking for you, they find you. Uh, number five, Google Maps optimization. So hopefully you show up on maps. Number six, paid search. We spend a little bit for paid search because I believe it puts us in a different category with Google. And number six, social media plan to include paid ads. That's number seven, actually. And finally, number eight, maybe most importantly, maximize your online reviews. Maximize online reviews. The more reviews you have, the higher you will be ranked. It's that simple. So I want to encourage you to really get your arms around marketing and developing a comprehensive marketing plan. It's your quickest path to success. Now, talked about marketing, so we're going to start bringing in new, new patients that choose you for reasons other than they're on your insurance. By the way, if you're going to do an ad, one of the cool ads you could do if you have an in-office membership plan is an ad that says something like this. No insurance, no problem. Ask us about, ours is called our TLC savings plan. Ask us about our TLC savings plan. And you could run that on Facebook. So digital photos for patient education. To be effective, your photos have to be simple. It can't be something that takes a lot of time. Because new patients, we've got to be busy. We've, we've got to have a, a quick appointment time. So we don't take the 32 series AACD series for all of our new patients 
because that would take about an hour and 15 minutes and that's not practical. However, we take these six photos on every new patient. So here, this comes from Dr. Frank Spear. I wanna give him credit for this. He taught me this system and it works extremely well. So here's the six photos. Number one, a head and shoulder shot. Number two, close up retracted view of the patient hold the retractors. Number three, upper lower occlusal view and upper number three occlusal view and number four lower occlusal view. We, we borrowed a chapter from our friends, the orthodontists. Number five, the left buccal corridor. And number six, the right buccal corridor. There's the six photos. And the reason we take these photos is most people are visually oriented and they respond best by visual means. Here's the camera we use. We use a simple dental point and shoot camera. That's a Canon uh, G16. Uh, we have an elaborate uh, SLR uh, Canon D50 with a ring flash. It weighs like 35 pounds. The first time my assistant put it on her neck, she fell over. Um, so we use a simpler camera. Now here's the ninja trick with this camera. Instead of uploading the photos to a monitor, upload them to a tablet, to a tablet. And here's why. It now becomes an interactive experience with your patients. If they're just looking at it on a monitor, it's passive. You put it on a tablet and put it on their lap and show them how to use it. Just take your finger and flick it. If you want to zoom in, uh, take your fingers and pinch out. So we load them on a tablet and then we make an excuse to leave the room. We say something like this. Um, Susan, doctor and I need to um, take a look at your radiographs. While we're doing that, would you do me a favor and look at those digital photos? Make a mental note of any questions you have and when we come back in the room, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Now, on a very rare, it's very rare when Paul and Tim come in the room that the patient doesn't have questions. Oh, what's this? What's that? What's this? And isn't it great when patients ask you questions? You bet. So much easier when they're asking you instead of you having to approach them first. They're approaching you about solutions. And this is the quickest way to do this. Phenomenal tip that we can all use. When it comes to the new patient experience, I want you to think about this. This is a wonderful quote from Maya Angelou. Sadly, we lost her last year. Um, I don't know about you, but she, uh, I, I always find, found her, her, her soul and her thoughts to be uh, inspiring to me. Maya Angelou said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will for never forget the way you made them feel. If you can build your new patient experience around this concept, you will have a remarkable new patient experience. And if, if I can help you with this real simply, um, I learned this from Dale Carnegie uh, in his book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. What is everybody's favorite topic? Themselves. So if we can make the appointment about them, not us, you know, another way to think about that also from Dale Carnegie, when you're talking to someone, and this goes for a doctor, hygienist, assistant, when you're talking to your patient, it's more important to be interested than interesting. Sometimes I think we're trying to be interesting, but it's more important to be interested. Does that make any sense? We're coming into the home stretch here. I want to talk about this new patient experience a little bit more. So new patient experience. We start our new patient experience very differently than most practices. Think about how most patients are greeted when they walk into your office. Uh, not your offices that are here at this course or hopefully watching this on Facebook, but probably some colleagues of yours. Patient shows up in the new office, some grouchy lady at the front desk throws them a clipboard and says, fill out both sides, I said both sides. I'm sure that doesn't happen in your office. What if we took them on a quick tour Three minute tour. Let me tell you what it's not before I tell you what it is. It's not a Disney behind the scene, open up every cupboard, show them every nook and cranny. It's simply a way to talk to them about what's unique and different about your practice. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go through our tour uh, for time reasons, but I'm gonna share with you where we stop our tour. And this is three minutes. Carly usually does this in our practice, and I'm gonna describe this to you. Imagine some beautiful after photos of patients that we've done complex dentistry on. 
after photos. Our entire back office has, has these beautiful after photos, professionally taken. And they're actual patients that we have done complex dentistry. Carly stops at one of these photos and says, Linda, although we're a general dental practice, our doctors and team members also have advanced training on things like dental implants, cosmetic dentistry, um, complex restorative dentistry, treating patients with sleep apnea. All of the photos you see back here in the office are actual patients of ours that we've helped have the smile of their dreams. Well, that's a tour. I'm glad you're here. So notice what I did with that. I let the patient know what's available in your practice without selling, without selling. Does that make sense? Think about how you can do that in your practice. So our actual new patient visit, it's a two hour visit. It goes like this. Here's the seven components. Start with an office tour. We then do a patient interview. The patient interview is all about learning about our patients. Next, we take the six digital photos. Next, take the x-rays, necessary x-rays. That's all done by my new patient coordinator. That's the first 30 minutes of the appointment. Next is the doctor part of the new patient exam, including reviewing the photos on the iPad. Finally, we get to the hygiene appointment, and then we finish up with financial arrangements and scheduling. That's our seven point. It's a two hour appointment. It combines record and hygiene. You can separate those. Uh, I do think it's, it's perhaps better clinically to have separate appointments, have a records appointment than a hygiene appointment. But we found when new patients call, what do they want? They want their teeth cleaned. So we, just, we decided to quit fighting them and just combine them in one appointment. It's a two hour appointment, 30 minutes of doctor time. It's worked extremely well for us. Well, as I finish up here, I want you to think of this question. What kind of legacy will you leave? What's the legacy that you want to leave? Are you going to let the insurance company dictate your legacy? I'd suggest not, because they don't care. They don't care about the quality of care. Imagine if you buy, let's say doctors, you're interested in, um, say, buying a CBCT, buying a combi. So the insurance company says, oh, because you've invested in this, we're gonna raise your fees. No, they don't care about that. All right, one last slide. I wanna close with a poem. The poem goes like this. It's called Promise Yourself by Christian Larson. It was written in 1920. It's as relevant today as it was written almost 100 years ago. Promise yourself to be so strong that nothing can disturb your peace of mind. Promise yourself to talk health, happiness, and prosperity to everyone you meet. Promise yourself to help all your friends feel that there is something in them. Promise yourself to look at the sunny side of everything, make your optimism come true. Promise yourself to think only of the best, to work only for the best, and expect only the best. Promise yourself to be just as enthusiastic about the success of others as you are about your own. Promise yourself to forget the mistakes of the past and press on to the achievements of the future. Promise yourself to wear a cheerful countenance at all times and give every living creature you meet a smile. And finally, no, nope, a couple more. Promise yourself to give so much time to the improvement of yourself that you have no time to criticize others. And finally, promise yourself to be too large for worry, too noble for anger, too strong for fear, and too happy to permit the presence of trouble. Friends, I would suggest that if you would comport yourself this way every day, you will be making a big step towards leaving a legacy in your practice. Some contact information for me. I'd love you to be in touch, uh, if you would. Here's some contact information uh, for me. Here's a website. Feel welcome to reach out to me on the website. Here's my email address. I'd love to receive emails. Uh, there's my cell number. I don't normally give that out, but feel welcome to text me if you like. Don't leave a message, but you can text me. Um, I'll be happy to text you back. And then finally, if you're on Facebook, follow me on Facebook, I'll follow you back. Friend me on Facebook, I'll friend you back. And if you're on Twitter, follow me on Twitter, I'll follow you back. Uh, and then I'd invite you to be a listener to The Thriving Dentist Show. Uh, we have a lot of fun with that podcast. Uh, we'd love to have you join us as a listener. Well, there we go. I, I bet we have some questions. We do. Really good. Hey, round of applause for Gary Packers. Yeah, we do have some great questions here. Elijah, you want to kick off some Q&A? Absolutely. Uh, Jennifer Clement uh, from Utah. Have you noticed a drop in production when you have two-hour new patient appointments, Gary? Oh, okay. So that's a good question. So 
is a new patient appointment production or not? Uh, it's a trick question. It's not productive in terms of our, what you produce per hour, but it's very productive in terms of your future schedule. But you have to block those. In our practice, we see three new patients a day. So we've got an hour and a half of doctor time booked for those three appointments, leaving uh, six and a half hours of production time to hit our production goal that day. That's a great question. Awesome. Next question, Bob Malone. He didn't say where he's from, but best way to upload to tablet. Oh, okay. So you can do it digitally. You can upload by Wi-Fi. But I think the best way to do that is to take the photo capture card. They make adapters for the iPad. You know, understand most of your computers are PCs in the office and the iPad is a Mac and the PC and the Mac doesn't play well together, which is what happened in the presentation today. But there's a little pigtail that plugs into the bottom of your uh, iPad, and it's a card reader. Uh, you can take the card out of the photo capture card out of the camera, plug it into the card reader, and it immediately transfers. Literally takes five seconds. Is that an iFi card by chance? It's uh, it is an iFi card, and it's an iFi photo card reader. You bet. Here's one for you <clears throat> regarding trends that you notice in dentistry or things you're seeing happen now. Uh, what is it, as you do consulting in private practices, or you travel around the world speaking, or on your podcast interviewing experts, what are a couple, what, what is the biggest trend in private practice ownership that you think everybody in this room and on Facebook needs to know about? So, so the biggest trend, clearly, is the rise of corporate dentistry. Uh, corporate dentistry is the fastest growing segment of, of dentistry. That's not necessarily bad news. So may I expound on that? So think about that for just a minute. Um, most of the corporate offices are not very good at customer service. On their best day, they might be a B or a B plus on their best day. And some of them never get to that level. If you can master the people side of it, where we know our patients' names, we know their spouses' names, we know their kids' names, we know their dogs' names, we know their hobbies and we know their interests, it provides a point of distinction that the corporate offices generally don't do well. And I think it becomes a wonderful way to distinguish, it becomes your secret sauce for people choosing you. Some people just want the cheapest possible dentistry. It's, and I can show you how to do that. The problem is you wouldn't want to work in your own office. I think a better model is to set it up in a way that allows you to provide individual care, individual attention, and there's a strong segment of the population that wants that. They want that. We love it when someone comes from one of these corporate offices, so I didn't like it over here, they become patients for life in our practice. So I think the biggest trend is this growth of corporate dentistry, but it's not necessarily bad news as, as it relates to individual practitioners. Thank you, that's awesome. I love hearing that, especially because I, I too am a firm believer that the rise of corporate dentistry actually opens more opportunities for private practice owners to see the patients they want. And just to show you this, uh, I'll call him out. Uh, Lincoln Parker was one of my guests on The Thriving Dentist Show. That's not a name you will recognize. He's a young dentist in, in uh, Southern California. Lincoln opened a scratch practice, by the way, with some help from this fellow right here. He opened a scratch, a scratch fee for service practice in Tustin, California, in Orange County, California. And, and Jamie, what did everyone tell Lincoln? He's crazy. You can't do that. <laughs> and Lincoln, the more people that told him, guess what it did? It just made his resolve that much stronger. He opened a fee-for-service practice from scratch in 2014. Here it is, three years later. Absolutely thriving. Everyone told him he couldn't do it. I love it. Go. Gary, you are the number one podcast dentist. You are the number one frequent flyer dentist, dental <laughs> consultant. You go. <laughs> You're everywhere. I, I do have that distinction. I've got seven million air miles. And I love the way you put the emotion into the mindset, you know, to create the reaction. So I'm going to put you on the real hot seat. I'm going to ask a team question. How do you imagine yourself a St. Bernard dog? You're a rescue dog, and you're going into a practice. How do you create a symphony 
out of a band of Discord, a team in Discord. <laughs> uh, how much time do we have? Uh, you have 30 seconds. Okay, 30 seconds on 30 that. seconds. Um, we do this all the time. Our, my core business is myself and my team work with practices all over the country to help you develop a thriving practice. That's a very common situation for us. First thing we do is develop a culture, a team culture. Um, and we develop a culture where it's all about taking care of the patients. And what I find is that most team members absolutely rise to that challenge. We provide strong leadership, we provide strong direction. Um, we help our team members realize that we're in the business of changing lives every day, and we help take some of the barriers away from them. I love it when uh, our team members don't have to spend their time fighting with insurance companies all day. Uh, we can instead spend our time taking care of patients. But I really think it starts and ends with culture, and a positive culture, all moving in the same direction, trying to take the best possible care we possibly can uh, of our patients, and moving, removing the barriers to being able to do that. Two of the co You have to line up a team mindset with a doctor's vision. Yeah, you really do. You know, uh, and uh, sadly, many dentists have not taken the, the time to allow themselves the luxury of truly thinking about, if the world was perfect, how would I develop my practice? You know, uh, uh, maybe I'll close on this point. Um, I happen to believe that we live in the greatest country of the world. I hope you believe that as well. Uh, I think this is the greatest country in the world because we have freedom of choice. Doctors, each one of you have the freedom to decide how you want to run your practice. You literally have that freedom. Yes, I understand circumstances. Yes, I understand the challenge. Yes, I understand patients asking questions about insurance. But if we can let them know that we care about you, we say this to our patient. Listen to this very carefully. Linda? Your insurance company doesn't care about your health. Is that a true statement? Yes. Linda, your, insurance, your dental insurance company does not care about your health, but we do. It's an amazing shift in patients' mindset. Well done, my friends here in the room and all over the world. Now you know why the next time you hear the name Gary Takis, you will understand why dentistry rocks. Gary, thank you. Thank you, guys. So, right now, we're going to take a brief commercial break, and when we come back, we'll have a moment of time where if you're online, you can register for CE for our next presenter. You will love this next discussion. It will cover so many aspects of the things and touch on so many different pockets of topics we've already addressed at an entirely new perspective. You're gonna love it. Come right back here in about six minutes. We'll see you soon.